In May 1998, 15-year-old Kip Kinkle murdered his parents and two classmates, as well as injuring 25 others, after engaging in a shooting spree that ended up in his school's cafeteria. In the investigation, it emerged that he had been taking popular antidepressant medication Prozac since the summer of the previous year. In December 2000, Michael McDermott went on a shooting rampage at his workplace, Edgewater Technologies, killing seven of his co-workers. During his trial, the court heard testimony that in the weeks before the shooting, McDermott had tripled the dosage of his antidepressant medication, Prozac, from 70 mg per day to 210 mg. In March 2005, 16-year-old Jeff Weiss shot and killed nine people, including five students at Red Lake Senior High School in Minnesota, before turning the gun on himself. It was later revealed he had been undergoing treatment for depression and had been on Prozac at the time. In September 2008, Finnish post-secondary student Matti Sari shot and killed 10 other students on campus before killing himself. The official Finnish government report on the incident revealed that he had been taking an SSRI medication at the time of the shooting. SSRI stands for Selective Serotonin Reuptake Inhibitor, and it is a class of drugs that is often used to treat depression and anxiety. It includes Prozac, Zoloft, Celexa, Paxil, and a host of other commonly prescribed antidepressants and the perpetrators of a raft of school shootings, mass murders, and other violent incidents in recent years have been taking them. And so it was perhaps not surprising when the culprit of this month's mass shooting at Fort Hood, Specialist Ivan Lopez, turned out to be taking unnamed antidepressants himself. We have uh, very strong evidence that he had a uh, medical history uh, that indicates uh, unstable psychiatric or psychological condition. Lopez had been prescribed powerful antidepressants and the sleep drug Ambien. He was getting help. Dr. Javier Amador interviewed Major Nadal Hassan, who killed 13 people here at Fort Hood in 2009. Mental health issues, he says, must be aggressively treated, particularly when antidepressants are given. You have to be very cautious and, and take care to be aware of which symptoms are improving more quickly than others. People's motivation comes back, their ability to sleep comes back, they feel more energy, but they're still feeling hopeless and suicidal. Although it is yet to be reported, and may in fact never be revealed, precisely what type of antidepressant Lopez was taking, or whether it was an SSRI, the number of confirmed SSRI shooters in recent years has raised the question of a causal link between the medication and incidents of violence. Although the drug manufacturers are quick to downplay this connection as anecdotal or coincidental. Too often people like to assume, they project, they make a little bit of logic, and they say, whoa, that could theoretically explain a large problem. That's faulty logic. Boca Raton psychiatrist Abby Strauss says linking SSRI discontinuation to violence is oversimplistic, and he calls spreading the theory, quote, scary. Mounting scientific evidence points to a strong correlation between the use of psychiatric drugs in general, and SSRIs in particular, and violent behavior. In 2010, the Public Library of Science published a study titled Prescription Drugs Associated with Reports of Violence Towards Others, which examined how 484 drugs were associated with 1,937 documented cases of violent behavior. Of those 484 drugs, 31 of them were responsible for 79% of the violence, including 11 antidepressants. When incidents of school massacres in the U.S. are charted against prescription of psychiatric medication, the correlation is undeniable. Further research is needed to establish if there is a causal linkage between these pharmaceuticals and the incidents of violence, but critics of the big pharmaceutical manufacturers complain such research is hampered by the low standards for reporting that these companies are held to. One such critic, David Healy, author of over 150 peer-reviewed papers in the field of psychiatry and the author of numerous books, including Pharmageddon, joined me on the Corbett Report last week to discuss this issue. And you have, for example, on uh, davidhealy.org, your own website, you have an article on the 25th anniversary of the introduction of Prozac, um, how Prozac has changed psychi psychiatry since it was first approved. And in that, you list uh, the, the startling fact that there are probably something between 1,000 to 1,500 extra suicides in the U.S. each year triggered by an antidepressant, an extra 2,000 to 2,500 in Europe, and there are probably between 1,000 and 1,500 ec extra episodes of violence in the U.S. each year, and an extra 2,000 to 2,500 extra episodes in Europe, which is a startling figure to be 
pinned down towards one class of, of drugs. Um, how can we make that linkage? And why is that not more well known amongst the general public? Well, the linkage comes from my access to the clinical trial data that was used to bring drugs like Prozac, Zoloft, Paxil, and the other drugs in the SSRI group drugs to the market. Most doctors generally haven't got to see all of the clinical trial data uh, behind these drugs. One of the unique things that we've got at the moment is that if I was to make a claim about a drug saying that I've got a drug that will be useful treatment for the flu or asthma or whatever, and didn't let people see the data behind my claim, like, for instance, if you were asking me on this program now, okay, that's fine that you make this claim, but show me the data. If I refuse to show you the data, it will be the end of my career. If I refuse to show my academic colleagues the data, it will be the end of my career. But the pharmaceutical industry get to hold the data back and they only drip feed out to people the data that they want you to see. Now, I've been a, an expert witness in some legal cases that have involved this group of drugs in the case of people who have become homicidal or become suicidal. And because of that, I've had access to clinical trial data that a lot of other people haven't seen. And once you get to see that data and add it up, that's the data that underpins the estimate that there could be up to one or 2,000 people going on to become suicidal or are possibly homicidal in the United States and the same number in Europe. The reason a lot of other people don't say the same kind of things is they still haven't had access to, to the data. They see me saying these things, uh, 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 but they feel, I guess, that it isn't um, uh, enough to see a person like David Healy say these things for us to believe it. Uh, we have to see the data with our own eyes before we'll be prepared to believe it. Except, of course, if the kinds of things that I say that I've just said to you now, for instance, or that, that you've just read out from uh, uh, the blog posting, if I've got it wrong, I'm going to be sued by the pharmaceutical companies. I mean, so I, I think people can take from the fact that I haven't been sued and I feel able to say these kind of things, that actually there is data there. They can't see it, but there is data there to, uh, to support these claims. Further complicating the issue is the fact that the general public is often, as in the case of the Fort Hood shooter, left in a state of limbo regarding the medical history of the perpetrators of these mass shooting events. Often stories are reported with vague and unconfirmed details about antidepressants, or sometimes just medication. It can be difficult for the average person to sort through the daily reports of adverse and violent effects of these types of drugs. One website that helps in that effort is ssristories.org. Begun in the 1990s, it is a repository of over 5,000 news articles in which prescription drugs are linked to adverse events, including incidents of violence. Last week, Julie Wood, one of the proprietors of the site, joined me to discuss the problem of sorting through the often incomplete information from these reports. Well, when we talk about complications when it comes to exploring these issues, I think another complication is, of course, that medical histories are generally kept private even after the death of the people involved in these stories. So we only ever come at it from the, the outside perspective, usually based on what we find in media reports. Um, I'm not sure if SSRI Stories does any independent or other types of vetting or if there's other ways to get information about any of these the, the people involved in these stories but i've found for example in the past i found lists of of mass shooters who were on some type of antidepressant and when i tried yes. to verify some of the people and w what what was their medical history what drugs were they taking how do we know this there are people on those lists that i've seen that i can't in any way verify were on any type of uh, psychotic medication so i i don't know where some of these lists come from i don't know how we access this information. Have you encountered that type of problem when it comes to documenting some of these cases? Definitely. And it's very interesting because what we're talking about is mostly the U.S. And one of the things I've learned um, is that every state has different legislation with respect to privacy in terms of crime scene photos and toxicology reports and autopsy reports. And it ranges from everything from it's public information to that it is totally sealed. And then in between, there's some states that allow um, some access to people with 
quote, legitimate interests like a researcher. We have um, some, I've made some links and my husband's made some links with researchers in other countries where coroner's reports and toxicology reports are available. And I have read a lot of those and I've talked to the people and seen the data from some of those. And that is really fascinating because one of the things I learned there and to just to um, divert a little bit is you go to all the SSRI deaths. So you look at um, the deaths where SSRIs have been involved and case after case after case, you see the coroner saying, well, you know, he hanged himself, but we can't be sure that it was deliberate. You go, what? And you read so many of these things that you start to think, well, no wonder the suicide rate hasn't changed. <laughs> Nobody's counting suicides as suicides. So that's one thing I picked up from that. But your original point about the jurisdictional issues on privacy making it very difficult to uncover some of the truth is very true. In the final equation, the question of the causal linkage between SSRIs and indeed other forms of psychiatric drugs and incidents of violence needs to be taken seriously. There are many factors at play here, from differences in individual reactions to the fact that people who are more likely to commit violent acts in the first place are often the people who are prescribed these drugs. But the threat of violence has been taken seriously enough that the FDA in the US, the Ministry of Health in Japan, and other similar bodies in countries around the world have added a warning in their guidelines for antidepressants. According to the Japanese Ministry of Health, there are cases where we cannot rule out a causal relationship of hostility, anxiety, and sudden acts of violence with the medication. And in the FDA formulation, antidepressant medicines may increase suicidal thoughts or action in some children, teenagers, and young adults within the first few months of treatment. How can it be seen to be a good thing for anyone but the drug manufacturers themselves that these drugs have been on the market for decades and the bodies in charge of regulating them still can only offer such wishy-washy, non-evidence-based statements? The issue of drug-linked violence is one that we as a society need to start discussing and acting on soon. Otherwise, we will continue to let the status quo be ruled not by doctors or patients or their loved ones, and certainly not by the victims of these mass murders, but by the men in the boardrooms of these pharmaceutical companies who have been shown time and time again to care about nothing other than their own bottom line. Hold on, hold on. So you're yeah. telling me that Bear knew that this drug was infected with the AIDS virus, they yanked it from the market in America, and then they dumped it in markets overseas? They had to figure out a way, Joe, to make a profit on a product that they could not sell in America. So they made a huge profit. They, jumped, they dropped the product in Japan, Spain, and France. By the way, Joe, government officials in France that allowed that to happen actually had to go to prison for it. In America, not one corporate executive for this company has been indicted or even criminally investigated by our Justice Department. Why not? This video is brought to you by the subscribers of BoilingFrogsPost.com. For more information on this and other topics, please go to BoilingFrogsPost.com. For more information and commentary from James Corbett, please go to CorbettReport.com.